you're interested in seeing what type of businesses and individuals are getting approved for those, uh, go on the FAA's website and you'll be able to see every single one that's pending and every one that's been granted. I see. And you'll have an opportunity to make public comment on those during the open period prior to them being granted. And a lot of people do that. Okay. So recently there was a high profile situation where a company was being fined many, many millions of dollars for their going against FAA regulations. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that? Do you think that that's something we need to be concerned about? Mm -hmm. I think it's something that everybody should be concerned about because it's showing that, especially right now, the FAA is looking to make an example out of certain companies especially, but that's going to trickle down to the individual as well. And at this point in UAS technology where the regulations aren't solid, but the technology is there and it's affordable for the average person, uh, if you are being reckless, if you are operating outside of the standards, you should expect that you might be that poster child for the, uh, for the example that the FAA is looking to make. And I think that that's what happened with the company in Chicago that was fined, I believe it was $1.9 million. I don't have any inside or special knowledge of that, but I certainly read the articles and followed the story closely. And it sounds like over the last couple of years, they had been warned many times for their aerial operations uh, that they were not flying with the proper uh, 333 exemptions or uh, proper authorization to, to do what they were doing, and yet they continue to do it. They subscribed to the theory that the FAA can't regulate what they're saying that they can regulate. They don't have the authority to. And I believe that they also subscribe to the theory that uh, the FAA has no teeth. They're not going to come and throw you in jail. They're not going to, uh, there's not going to be any penalties. And the FAA really showed them otherwise. And it's being appealed. And they, the, the company may win. They may have it reduced. They may have it thrown out. But uh, it's going to cost them a lot of money to try and prove mm -hmm. their point. And they may lose and may have to uh, end up paying more. So I would say to avoid that, again, stick as close to the regulations as you possibly can. Well, uh, that's a serious warning. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the 333 certification. So some of the people out there are pilots and they'd like to know uh, how difficult is it to apply? What's involved mm -hmm. for, for that application? So the 333 exemption is something that you can submit online, which makes it great. You can go to the FAA's website. You can view a list of already granted exemptions and you can go through that list and find an individual if you're an individual find an individual if you're a company find a company and look through them and find one that matches pretty close to what you're looking to accomplish with your 333 exemption you can then copy that uh, I'm not saying to infringe upon their word-for-word -word mm -hmm. documents, mm -hmm. but it gives you a really good guideline. And if it's already been approved by the FAA, it shows that that is the type of format that they're looking for. And it's going to be very comprehensive. Uh, my exemption was uh, 27, 28 pages when I submitted it. And a majority of that was were uh, line items. It's, it's exemption after exemption where you're saying, here is what the law is or the regulation is, and here is my uh, proposal to that, and here's why I believe that my proposal will not endanger the national airspace. And that is the best way to go about it. There's many people online that will offer to complete your, your 333 mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Some of them are attorneys and probably offer excellent service. Mm -hmm. I know one of those attorneys who okay. is uh, one of the leading authorities in the country as far as uh, drone aviation laws and the 333 exemption. If you can afford it, if, if this is something where you are a large business and you are going to be doing a lot of commercial operations, spend a little bit of money and hire the attorney. If you're somebody like you or I where this isn't our, our everyday profession, but it is what we would like to do and what mm -hmm. we enjoy doing and would like to expand further upon, then uh, I believe that you're going to be suited just fine to put in the legwork yourself 
and follow the, the examples of what's already been granted and change them to meet your needs. Is there anything else that people need to know in order to apply? Anything else you, you left out? Well, the 333 exemption is going to be for a specific aircraft and for specific purposes. And so that's what you're going to want to indicate on there. So okay. what are we looking at for cost? There is no cost to apply for the 333. Oh. So you can submit that. The only cost would be if you were going to hire assistance to do that or purchase a template online. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that. I went through and did the work myself. I spent mm -hmm. approximately a week uh, revising documents and getting it ready to go, but mm -hmm. it was worth it to me to save the money, and you're gonna learn a lot by doing it yourself. It's just like when you build your first aircraft. Mm -hmm. It simply means that you're gonna know how to fix it when you crash a nicer one. So that's, uh, I think there's some value in doing it yourself. The, what I guess the caveat that I would add is that if you currently own a Phantom 3 uh, professional. And however, someday you may want to upgrade to an Inspire one, or you may want to uh, purchase a Blade Chroma or the Solo 3DR. List each of those in your oh, 333 exemption mm -hmm. because the length of time that you wait for an amendment to your granted exemption is going to be the same as what it is to just put it in there in the first place. So if they're all sort of a similar class, mm -hmm. I listed the Phantom, the Inspire, the Chroma, the 3DR, the uh, Spreading Wings. Uh, I listed a variety Anything of aircraft in could... there okay. so that conceivably in the future, I would be able to do that. I see. Now, one thing that I thought seemed reasonable is why can't I just put in there the DJI Phantom class of aircraft? Because that would cover me if I flew a Phantom 2 or a 3 or a 4 when they come out. Or eventually we're going to be flying the Phantom 12s. And uh, that, from the advice that I've received and from what I've seen online, you cannot get your exemption or your petition for exemption granted unless you have a specific aircraft model listed in there. So uh, you can't do a blanket DJI product or uh, Blade or Horizon Hobby product. You've got to list them each individually. You also have to list your purposes. So I don't plan to take real estate photography or videos, but I listed that in my petition simply because if it were to come up, mm -hmm. I know a few realtors, if they were to ask me or see some other videos that I did online, hey, would mm. you be willing to do this for me? Mm. Are you legally able to do this for me? I'll be able to say, yes, I am legally able to. It's not my forte, right? Uh, but it's something that I can, I can do without going back and filing an amendment for that. So inspections, uh, just list a variety of things that you're seeing other people getting approved for, mm -hmm. and you should be good to get that approved. Now, the 333 is at least a six-month wait, and it may go longer than that. And so my recommendation is that while you're waiting for the 333, you also apply for the second component, which is the registration of your aircraft. I was going to say, yeah. All aircraft that are operating outside of the hobbyist model aircraft guidelines are required to have a registration number. And that is going to be the N number, just like you see on every other aircraft or helicopter in North America. Okay. Uh, the N is for the designator for North America, and then you'll have a number that follows that. For that, it's, uh, it's not complex, it's not expensive, but you have to follow very specific guidelines. And again, my recommendation is to go online and find other applications that have been sent in and view the FAA has a bullet point checklist for registering small UAS aircraft on their website that will tell you exactly what they're looking for and the exact statements to include in your in your application. The actual application itself is paper application. It cannot be downloaded online. You have to get it from your local uh, FAA field office and you can email them via the FAA's website and they will put one in the regular US mail to arrive at your house a week later. I got mine. Mm -hmm. I completed that. I completed the statement of the facts that they were requesting. I mailed it in and it got rejected the first time. And it happened quickly though, which was good because the only thing worse than being told no is being told no months later. So a week later, I got uh, in a letter from them stating that they wanted some clarification about a couple of the items. I purchased my 
Phantom off of Amazon. And they wanted a statement included in there that it was a new product purchased off the shelf from Amazon and that it had never been registered in another country before. So I included that in there. I thought that I had already had a statement that covered that, but they wanted it to specifically say Amazon. And I submitted that new notarized letter to them. And approximately two weeks later, I received my uh, end number registration in the mail. I see. So, and I now have that posted on my aircraft.